in. These three questions that came in shouldn't take that long, but let's get right to it. The first question, all from the same customer though, are why do we only get the morning alerts for covered calls? I know it is the most popular, but some of us can't come up with the capital required to purchase covered calls for long durations often needed. Can you also include weekly options on Fridays and other pick strategies such as long calls? All right, now the straight answer is, to the second part of the question is no, okay? Meaning that the price watch alerts and the morning updates are actually compiled by a third party group, okay? They use our patented search tools to identify covered call positions that match their criteria. And then they send them out to their subscribers and as a perk, they send the price watch alert morning update out to our trial members and subscribers as well. So we can't change the price watch alerts. Now, what are we referring to? Every morning around 9.30, the price watch alert sent out with a top X amount of covered calls that were found. You can see the archive at any time by going into the Learning Center on your Power Options account. Just scroll down here and go to Priority 1 Email Archive. There you have a listing by date of all the price watch alerts back to uh, 3,937 days worth, really. The price watch alert looks like this. It'll have your first name. It'll show the top covered calls listed for these symbols. It'll give you the price, the return, the time frame, November 35 call for 440 with buying MLHR at 3809. Shows you the net debit and the percentage return. Okay, now, three things off the top of the bat. Number one, these are designed to be sort of trading ideas, not recommendations or suggestions. And again, we don't put them together. They give this key rating here for each one of the covered calls that they list. I've emailed them a few times, never gotten a response. I don't know what that means. Also, you see here that the covered calls that are listed are out to September, out to November. And Jerry kind of mentioned that in his question. So these might be trading ideas that you might want to look into but this might not match your goals, going that far out in time, going in the money. Now, although we can't change the price watch alerts, you can opt out of it at any time. Simply go into the My Account. Now, let's go back here. Simply go back to the uh, main page and you can go underneath the main home tab to My Account and you can opt out of the price watch alerts. Now, what can you do? You see those covered calls, but you don't like the time frame. You want to do weeklies. You want to do different stocks. No problem. All you have to do, let me clear that up for everyone. Get these drawings out of here. All you have to do in any strategy is create your own search based on your criteria. So you'll see that you have the defaults available in every search. Here's the covered calls, the picks, monthly picks of the day developed by Ernie and the weekly picks of the day. Whatever strategy you want to use, whatever search criteria you want to use, or if you create your own search, you can then simply click Get Results by Email. And this will allow you to go into the strategy and select which reports you want to have emailed to you at any time during the day. So although you can't change the price watch alerts, you can create your own search for long calls since you don't do covered calls bull put credit spreads, bear call credit spreads, use the power options defaults that are available or your own search, and select to have those emailed to you at 10 a.m. What happens is, of course, the system will run the search and email you the results that match your criteria of the search you selected. So at any time, you could just go into long call as well, since you can't do the covered calls, and you can create your own search or use the defaults. Once again, click Get Results by Email, select when you want to have them sent to you, and you're all set. And of course, just go into the My Account tool to opt out of the Price Watch Alerts. That's just a quick review. If you want more information, we recently, I recently did a webinar there, Trade Recommendations or What Are the Price Watch Alerts? This webinar walks you through what the Price Watch Alerts are, how you can set the search to create your own email list in the morning, and of course, things you can also do uh, as well to create your own search, okay? Um, 
a question just came in. Let me go back here. It was from, was that Rajiv? I apologize. Comment, question. Uh, let's see. Oh. Yeah, it was Rajiv. He says, what criteria do they use for stocks on the move? Um, I don't know if it was this one. Am I in long calls? Yeah. Oh, I think I was back in covered calls. That's a search we created. I don't even know what's in it. It's something we created during a webinar uh, based on a customer's selection. Stocks on the move. Where did you see that? Um, I don't know where you saw that, Rajiv. I'll have to find it. Um, but it's probably using something along the lines of a Bollinger Band breakout, um, or the, uh, oh, okay, see, that's, once again, okay, I'm sorry, my apologies. Rajiv says uh, the stock's on the move that he gets from the email. Again, in the Price Watch Alert morning update, that's not us. I don't know what criteria they're using. Okay, they're sending it out to our subscribers as a perk, all right? So I don't even know what the criteria are. You can see more information about that. Just click on the free webinars page, powerup.com slash webinars.asp. Watch that recent video on what are the price watch alerts, how you can set up your own tool, and have those emailed to you as well. All right, so let's go back now. And I'm going to quickly switch screens one more time, a couple more times actually. All right, so that was for question number one. Question number two, you mentioned the importance of looking for the percent IV range. This is mostly for buying options, but selling options is used well. So you don't have to pay for the premium of unusually high IV. And you talked about setting the percent less than 70 or 80, but also look at the range. I, mean, I don't see the column for a high-low range of IV. Now, that is correct. We don't show the column for the high or low of the IV, but you can see it very quickly. Let's go back once more. Let's take a long call search. And what I might do in my long call searches, uh, any of my defaults here, but let's just go ahead to go to Bollinger Bands, is I might use the percent implied volatility range filter when I'm buying an option. Even as part of a married put, I do this. But if I'm buying a call or buying a put, I'm going to try to make sure that the percent implied volatility range is in its low range, usually below 70. What does that mean? It means that right now that the option is in the lower percentile of its total IV over the history of the option since it was released on the market. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and submit that, see if we get any of these out. Okay, now, as I'm looking here, I just have some basic columns selected. But I'll go into Choose Columns now. And you can do this in any search. You can customize <clears throat> the criteria columns that you're viewing. We're going to add in implied volatility. We're also going to add in the percent implied volatility range down here at the bottom. I might even choose the IV over HV ratio or IV over SV. Uh, what you're not seeing, Jerry mentioned, is we're not seeing the total range. And that's okay. So let's go ahead now and submit and save our columns. Refresh the page here. There we go. All right, so now I've got my percent implied volatility range. First option here on CEQP, October 35, 41%. 37% here for WWE, and so forth. Okay, now, I see the percent implied volatility range. What do I mean by taking this with a grain of salt? Well, if the total IV for this option has been between 0.35 to 0.85, and right now it's at point, well, it'd be about 0.42 or so. No, it'll probably be about point, uh 50, let's say. Okay, that's in the 41 percentile of the range of 35 to 85. Okay. Now, if however, and that's important, that's where I want it to be. I want it to be sort of in that lower range. I don't want it to be up near 85 and then have the implied volatility collapse. That means I lose on the long call without the stock even moving. I suffer volatility crush. So I want to be somewhere into the lower range. But if the actual IV range is only 0.25 to 0.28, and right now we're at 0.26, well, that's not really overly significant, is it? It doesn't matter. That one hasn't had a big implied volatility movement on it. So in that case, even though it's still at 41% or so, or 33%, it could be at 0.27, and I'd probably have about the same price. 
Okay, but as I mentioned, we don't have the column for it here. The easiest thing to do is just use the More Information button. Go to Research. I'm sorry. And then go to Option Research. This tool shows you the full data that we have for the option, the bid, mid, last price, uh, total session volume today, previous session volume, open interest. And over here on the right, you've got your percent implied volatility range and the total range of implied volatility of this option over time. So it's just one click away to be able to see that. And this, and this one here is 0.1816 to 0.3794. Our current IV is at 0.2634, so that's pretty decent. I want to be in that range. If the implied volatility jumps back up to 0.37, that's going to favor my call. And if it drops down to 0.18, I'm going to lose some extrinsic value that's there, but not too much. Not a great amount there as well. Okay, going back to the search real quick. Um, did I select it? Yes. A uh, question came in from Mark. Yes, I believe it was Mark. He asked, what is the SIV in the IV-SIV column? IV over HV is the ratio of implied volatility of your option divided by the historical volatility of the stock. Investors use this to measure if an option is potentially overvalued or undervalued. If my IV-HV ratio is greater than 1, that implies that the historical volatility is lower, therefore my option seems overvalued. Might be something I'd be interested in selling, maybe not buying. The IVHV ratio, of course, is less than one. That means, theoretically, the option is undervalued, might be a good bargain to buy. The SIV is the Stocks Implied Volatility Index. This is the average of the in-the-money and out-of-the-money implied volatilities for all calls and puts on that stock over the next couple of expiration cycles. So rather than using the historical volatility of a stock, as a measure of where IV should be or as a comparison, what this ratio does is compare the implied volatility of your option compared to the average implied volatilities of the in the money and out of the money near term options for the same stock. So is your option considered overvalued or undervalued comparison to the other options around it is another way to use it. That's SIV, the stock's implied volatility index. While we're here on the long call, I'm not going to slip back over to the screen there and read the next question or show you the next question and then uh, jump to it. I'm just going to read the question and then show it. So the third question was, while doing long calls, is there a way to specify that the difference between the current stock price and the break-even be less than a certain dollar amount? Okay, nice to be able to know that the stock only has to move X dollars given the price strike price of premium. The answer to that is no. On long calls or uh, long puts, I don't have a filter for what would be called percent to break even. And we don't show it as a dollar sign. On other strategies such as naked puts and credit spreads, we show the percent to break even. How far does the stock need to move before you're at break even? But remember, that's only at expiration. Okay, It's only if you hold the option all the way to expiration, how far do you need it to move before it's at break even? You can be at a profit if the stock moves up 20 cents tomorrow or on Monday, your call will gain maybe 5 cents. Technically, you're at a profit, right? And if it moves up 20 cents the next day, you'll still be at a profit, but you'll be very far away from the break even. What we tend to use, myself personally, Ernie, uh, and some others I know of that use this, uh, this strategy, long calls and long puts, is the percent to double. The percent to double shows you the theoretical change we would need in the underlying stock price in order to have your option price double in value. Now, it's a trade-off, isn't it? In theory, I want a lower percent to double. I might only want a 3% move in the stock to see my option price double, maybe a 4%. But what does that mean? That means most likely my option is going to be deep out of the money. If the stock just moves 2%, my option premium might double probably only if I'm trading three or four strikes out of the money and I paid a premium of 20, 30, or 40 cents. Stock was up 3%, that goes to 80, 90, maybe a dollar 20, double or triple that amount. I can't buy an in the money option three months out in time for four or five dollars and if the stock moves up 3%, expect that to go to eight to 10. So it's a trade-off. If you're more comfortable looking at options that are in the money, 
and a couple months out in time, you're going to have a relatively high percent to double. But that makes sense, doesn't it? It's perfectly logical. If you sort of gamble and you buy out of the money calls hoping for a movement in the stock, you would have a really low percent to double. But then again, you're talking about doubling 10 cents to 20 cents, 20 cents to 40 cents, and so forth. But that's the filter we tend to use instead of a percent to break even on the long options because we're more focused on where do we need to maybe get that 100% return or 80% return on the position as opposed to just being at the break even. But I'll talk to the programmers and see if I can get that percent to break even added into the position as well. Okay, hold on. All right, let's see here. All right, one moment. Scrolling. There we go. Okay. Good. Okay. So there's that. I'm looking at some comments here that came in and some of the questions. Just seeing if there's anything there I missed. Okay. It doesn't look like there is. So let's go back to square one. And we'll take the questions as they came in in order so far. And I'll keep scrolling through to see the comments. Okay, so Rajiv says, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mike. Great to be here. Great to see you here. And then Rajiv followed up with a question. So I wanted to create a married put position on GE. Bought 200 shares yesterday um, with the long put of January 18, 15 strike after earnings, but did not anticipate that much negative move. Can I still apply a married put or use the stock repair? Rajiv, I would use the stock repair in this case. Okay, so what Rajiv is saying, let's just take a look at GE. It's uh, down to 13.12, okay, it's down 4% or so. And what I want to do is go previous. I want to see what it was yesterday. It's at 13.73, and the earnings were beforehand. So let's say you have 200 shares at 13.73, roughly. Let's call it 17, 13.75, excuse me. All right, so we bought 200 shares there. They're now worth 13, 12. We're down about 4 or 5%. Now, if you're going to stay in the position long term and try to manage it, it's never a bad idea to add a put to protect against further losses. The problem with adding a put after a decline of any type, 4, 5, 6, 10%, is that you're already going to be semi locking in that loss, and now you've got to fight to repair it. You're going to stop yourself from getting further losses perhaps, or maybe only 2 or 3% more of potential further losses if there's a major decline continuing going forward. But it's not a repair by itself immediately, it's just to stop further bloodletting. Now what you could do is I could go into the married put and I could go into the insurance tool. And this is designed that if you have a gain in the stock, it shows you which put option might lock in the most amount of unrealized profit. But you can also use this potentially as a way to see what your risk would be based on your higher cost basis on some positions. Okay, so it did find some results here. I've got 1375 on GE. It does show me that um, you know I could buy some different put options here. And you were talking about the January, I'm sorry, 18, 15 strikes. So let's go to January. I was thinking at 19, of course. But let's go to January. Okay, so right now we have an unrealized loss of about 4.6%. And by purchasing the puts now, you see that, you know, the, uh, what did you say, the 15 put would have a max risk of 6.3%, because you're already taking into account that 4.4% loss, plus the time value, the put time value of 38 cents on the put that you're buying, so you'd still have a maximum risk of 6.3%, which isn't overly bad. But again, it's only about five or six months out in time, six months out in time. Uh, so we'd want to look at some of those uh, as well. All right. Now, in this case, because the loss has already been realized, the decline's already been realized, you know that you could still only have a 6.3% risk. I don't think this is this bad if you're expecting GE to recover. It might be beneficial to try to use the stock repair to get back to the current price and then evaluate a Mary put if you're still planning on staying in it longer. And of course, all we have to do there to evaluate the repairs, we can type in GE. We can use stock repair. 
and we just put in our cost basis. Now the trade-off here is that the premiums on GE aren't that high, so it might have a hard time finding a repair even though it's only down about 63 cents from your purchase price, or if you're 1380 a little bit more. Oh, well how about that? We do have some repairs that are available for this position using the 13 and 13 and a half combination. We're going to buy one of the 13, sell two of the 13 and a half for August. We only get a net credit of two cents. That's what I expected. But it does lower the break even down to 1337 from your cost of 1375. Lowest one here is out to January 2019. Uh, January 2020 lowers it to 1318, but that's at expiration. So you're probably going to stay with one of these August ones to help repair it. We only need 20 cents more movement to get back. Now, how does this work? Let's take a look. On a stock repair, what I'm going to do is buy one, usually at or slightly in the money call, and sell two higher strike calls for a credit. So buying the, in this case, it's two to four, because he has 200 shares of stock. So I could buy two of the 13 calls for 57 or 114, and I could sell four of the 1350 calls for 31 cents, which would give us 124. So we have a net credit of about 10 cents, or roughly 5 cents per share as we have 200 shares. Now, with only a credit of 5 cents, a cost basis of 1375, how are we getting this break even down to 1335? Well, it's because we're buying one and selling two at a higher strike at a credit. So if the stock's trading at 1335, we're down 40 cents from our purchase price of 13.75. The long call here for uh, August 31st, it has to go out to the 31st, but if the stock was trading at 13.35 on August 31st, that 13 call would be worth 35 cents. And we received a net credit of 5 cents. So 35 cents, sell to close the long call, we keep the 5 cents, that's a 40 cent difference, we've made back the 40 cents on the position. Now someone commented, why don't you just sell the 13 call for 57 cents and you've made up that 40 cents? Well, it's because it's below the current stock price. If I got a sign at 13, I only get 13.57 back. So I'm still down about 22 cents. I'm not at break even. The higher premium doesn't mean a better structure if you're below the stock price and you've taken a loss. You're selling the 13.50s. And if the stock moves up to 13.50, you'd only be at a 25 cent loss, but your long call is now worth 50 cents. So you have a profit of about 30 cents on the entire position. So if you are bullish and you think a recovery is near possible, Rajiv, it may be an okay idea to do this, but the net credit is a little bit of a bummer, isn't it? It's only five cents. You're buying one call and selling two with the repair, which means what? your commissions are probably going to be greater than that five cent net credit, so it might not work out for you. And then the other ones, these are debit repairs down here, I prefer the credit. The next credit that's available after that August series is December, and it's only about 11 cents. Okay, so that's a little bit tougher to come by in those situations. But I would maybe try to repair it first before doing the married put position, but as I showed you using the insurance tool, if you're planning on staying in it for six months, a 6.3% risk on GE is not that bad if you do feel strongly that the stock will recover over time. So that's using the insurance tool to identify the positions and also using the stock repair tool as well. Okay. All right. Uh, Sam says he's in a straddle at 14. Um, Oh, okay. If okay, so you say if, I'm sorry. If GE moved to 1450 by August 18th, is your upside also capped? Yes, it is. You have what essentially you have, and we'll we'll continue on with this one here. But what you essentially have, Rajiv, with the ratio repair, is a bull call debit at the 131350 strike and a covered call. What doesn't it do? It doesn't address the downside if there's further losses but it does cap the gain above 1350. Now you don't have to roll all four calls if it starts to move above 1350. You could just roll two of them and leave the initial bull spread open. The two contracts of the 13, the two contracts of the 1350. 
Close that out for full profit as you get closer to the August 31st expiration, get the 50 cents back. But you can roll two of the short calls just as you would a covered call if the stock starts to move above those strike prices. Sam brings up a good point. It won't give you the same break even. But since you have 200 shares, he said you could just sell one. But rather than just selling one, Sam, what I might do in this situation is buy one call, 13, and sell two. It's still a ratio where I can get 50 cents back for 100 shares, so my break even is not going to be that low. But what that does now with 200 shares is you still leave the upside open. You still get some benefit of the repair, but the break even goes up to 1348 from 1335. But whenever you have more than 100 share blocks, don't feel obligated to do the same two to one ratio I mentioned against your shares of stock. In this case, I can do a one to half ratio, lack of a better term, leave the upside open. Because in this case, I have the bull call spread, one contract of the 13, one contract of the 1350, a covered call with one contract against 100 of my 200 shares. The other 200 shares can continue to move up in price without being hedged out because of the obligation of the short call. So thank you, Sam, on that one as well. Um, in that case, and uh, uh, Rajiv, you said you're also looking for a butterfly, not finding the perfect strike. I don't think I'm going to go down that rabbit hole right now. I'm not going to try to build a butterfly around your 200 shares uh, or build a ratio butterfly around your 200 shares in this case, because I don't think because of the, unless you did a major broken wing butterfly, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> it's just because of the premiums that you use. Let's say I did go out to August 17th. My butterfly would need to be around probably the 13 strike, but that means the call's in the money. So I've got to go to 14 in this case, or I could go shorter term and try the 1350s. When you're using a series that has the 50 cent strike differences, the prices are so close to each other, it's very hard to do a condor or a butterfly to get a reasonable profit because you're, you're taking so much away from the premium you receive to buy the next option. You know, see here it's 13 and 12, it's 29 cents to 8 cents. That doesn't seem like, I'm sorry, 29 to 6 cents. That doesn't seem like that much, but it's about 20%, isn't it? 20% of what you're selling, you're paying back and you're doing it twice. Here's it's 25. So you could try a broken wing butterfly based on your expectations, but I don't think that's a, a butterfly is going to work in this case because of the lower premiums. Here are dollar strike differences, which might work, but if you go closer, those 50 cent strike differences are really, really difficult to manage, in my opinion. For me personally, you might be able to do well with them, Rajiv, but for me, they're very difficult to try to structure a four-legged spread, a butterfly, even a broken wing butterfly also in those scenarios. Okay. All right. Now, Fernando asked, could you use income method number nine to repair GE? It's not really repair. Income method number nine isn't really a repair in that case. What it is, Fernando, is if I was in a married put, which Rajiv is not. He doesn't have the put yet. He just has the 200 shares. So if the stock fell now, he's looking to buy a put to create the married put or do the repair first, then buy the married put. He doesn't have the put in place yet. If I had bought the shares at 13.75 and bought the 15 put the other day before the earnings and now the stock was down to 13, I might consider income method number nine in that scenario. But it's not repairing the position, it's lowering my cost basis, but it, might in it will increase the risk slightly. I'm in that case, I only do nine if I expect the stock to recover. If it doesn't recover, I could actually lose more percentage-wise on the position based on the structure of income method number nine. But if you have a stock that's fallen, you already had the radioactive trade in place from the beginning, you expect it to come back up because you feel this was an overreaction, Income method number nine is a great way to go. Okay, so let's move back up to the top. And uh, Sam, of course, says, hi, all in the room. Good afternoon. Uh, tough day with whipsaws. Yeah, I had that. Uh, I did an income method number six, the bear call spread on. I want to show this actually very quickly. One of my radioactive trades, I had a bear call spread on GOOS that I opened uh, a week ago. 
uh, on the 12th or the 13th when the stock was trading at $60.50. So I sold the 61 call for $1.05 and bought the 64 for $0.35. Cents. 70 cent net credit. And the income method number six, of course, leaves the upside open. Okay, so there's my 61 strike here. Here's my 64. Now, yesterday, the stock was at about 64.20. It was up here, okay, above, six, above both strike prices. And a customer said, when are you going to roll the 61 call? Well, I said, I kind of didn't need to because if it continues up, it just benefits the position. Whatever I'm losing here on the short call, I'm gaining back on the long now that they're both in the money. They're both going to a delta of one. And my shares are able to continue to rise. Unfortunately, what I should have expected to happen happened. Goose pulled back today and was trading in the 63.50, 63.60 range all day. What's interesting, however, is at the close of yesterday, my 64 call had a premium of about 60 cents. And someone said, well, why didn't you sell to close the call yesterday when it still had value left in it before it expired worthless today? Well, because if I had closed it, sold to close it got 60 cents, and the stock moved up to 66, my profit and loss chart would have been doing this, not this. Needed to leave the long call there. And notice, even though the stock pulled back, when we were up here at about $64, $64.50, I'm essentially at the exact same profit. Now, this does expire, but now this only cost me $2 to buy it back. And yesterday, when this was worth 60 that was about 210 I think. I bought it back for 220 I'm sorry. But when this was at 60 this 61 call was at 370. So the debit to close that spread yesterday would have been 230. I got a better price today. Of course, I had to close the position when the stock was at around 63 because I didn't want to wait all afternoon and have someone who's following the fusion trade at radioactive trading miss the adjustment. Shortly after I did that, 10, 15 minutes later, it dropped another 60 cents down to 62.70. I could have got a much cheaper price. Could have paid about a dollar 80, dollar 75 to buy to close that call. But I didn't want to, I wanted to wait to the end, but I have to post those trades. Uh, and Sam, uh, so I'm just saying with that, you know, the whipsaw effect, I was watching this all day. At 11 o'clock, the stock was at 62.50. I could have bought it back for dollar 60 at that time, but then it shot right back up. And in a couple of minutes, 15 minutes, it was back up to 63.80, pushing 64 again. So I, I was suffering in that in the last two hours as well. We had a great Microsoft and bank trades with the PM earnings. Facebook's going crazy with the calls uh, swing trade the last two months. Okay, I've been doing that back and forth too. So Sam's just kind of mentioning what he's doing. Okay, so you try to straddle on Skechers and Netflix after the parabolic move. Um, didn't quite get the gains back as well, uh, but you had some luck there. Okay, one second here. There we go. And there's that, and good. I'm going to move on to Kokan's question now. And Rajiv, I see your other comment, Rajiv, on GE. I'll take a look at that, but it's not a strategy I trade. Um, this is the same, think about it this way. Uh, we'll take a look at it in a minute, but real quick, Rajiv was asking about how the calls and the puts seem mispriced on GE, and he's wondering what we can do with Delta Neutral. That's not, those aren't strategies I really play with. We'll take a look at it in a little bit. But what the skew of the calls and puts remind me of is exactly what Sears was for almost two years straight. When you looked at any chain on Sears, the puts were always much more higher implied volatility, higher time value than the calls because everyone was just expecting it to continue to fall, to fall, to fall, to fall, and the action was in the puts, it wasn't in the calls. That tells you something. Lasted that way for about two years. Okay, um, so yeah, you could try to structure some kind of delta trade. I'm not a fan of delta neutral trades because normally in a delta neutral trade, you have to keep managing it to remain delta neutral. The broker's probably making more money than you are. Uh, and the examples I tried to do in my past about eight, nine years ago, trading delta neutral and gamma neutral strategies, there are too many adjustments and I wasn't getting the benefit. My broker was getting a little bit more benefit than I was. All right, so Kokon, let's build your structure here. He's giving me a trade that he's in and it's on TRN. And Oh, and Sam, I see you have four or five other comments there that you mentioned on HEAR. We'll get to those in just a minute as well. So we got a hundred here at thirty-seven oh eight, and it's here on thirty-seven oh eight. I'm sorry, purchased the July. This is just a different one. Thirty-six fifty call 
at 154. Okay. We'll just do one to keep it simple. How about that? Now, earnings on July 25th and IV is quite high at 58. VIX is at 1286. Don't worry about the VIX in this case. The implied volatility of your option is solely based on what's going to happen at the earnings, not related to what the VIX does. Okay. So is there a risk of volatility climbing? And even if the stock is up following earnings, the price of the call barely moves. No, you're thinking about it reverse. Okay. Let's take a look. So we've got earnings coming out July 25th on TRL, TRN, my apologies. Might get the drawings out of the way. Fantastic. All right, so you've got a break even at 3804, about a dollar away from where you are now. Your implied volatility, am I on the right stock, TRN? The implied volatility is only at 0 0.2943 for this particular option. Um, you said IV is quite high at 58. I'm not seeing that as a high IV. Let's take a look at the option research again. Percent IV range. Oh, okay, I see. I'm sorry, I see. Yeah, I was looking at the wrong thing. Never mind, my apologies. So we're at 0.5863, and it's right at the upper range of its implied volatility. Now, you're asking, is there a risk of volatility climbing, and even if the stock is up falling earnings, the price of the call barely moves? No, if volatility climbs because the stock gaps up, you'll still gain on the call. The problem is, is if it reverts back to its low, at 0.4422, which is the current low that it's seen for the life of the option. When was this released? Oh, this is this is an issue. This is only released a few weeks ago, a, a last week, I guess it looks like, because it's a weekly series for the 27th. So it was only released a week ago on the series to have the, the, the five series out in time which means that this is probably going to revert possibly lower than this. It might revert back to the historical volatility for the stock. Oops, sorry, which might be a little bit lower. Let's take a look here. Stock research very quickly. 50-day volatility is at 0.22. Okay, this is a danger. Why is it a danger? All right. So if the after earnings, if the stock moves up, let's say, two points, and it goes to $39, but your IV drops down to 0 0.22, you'll still have a profit because you're essentially intrinsic. You've got $2.50 of value based on $150. Your gain's going to go intrinsic. That's what's going to happen. This implied volatility is going to cut out because it's, you only have two days to expiration. You're going to need the stock to be at 38.04. Simple as that. Now, you might have a profit on Monday or on Tuesday prior to the earnings if the stock moves up and if the volatility increases also getting closer to earnings, one day closer, one day closer, it'll probably be, it's probably near where it's going to be the high for with that implied volatility, Kokon. You are going to see a volatility of crush, but since you're so close to expiration that the earnings come out on the 25th and the 27th is there, it's not going to retain a lot of time premium at all. You're going to go right to intrinsic after the earnings so you're going to need it to be at 3804 the day of, the day following, or on Friday the 27th. So the 25th, 26th, or 27th, you're going to need it to be at that price in order to take any profit. There is potential, however, that if the stock does go right to 38, yeah, you're going to be close to break even, and the volatility drops down to 0.22, you're going to be right at break even because you're going to go right to intrinsic. This volatility is going to dry out. Of course, if the stock falls, the implied volatility might spike, but your option is going to go close to zero because it's out of the money with only two days left. Okay, That's really close time frame there. So regardless of what volatility does, you might have a profit before the earnings, but after the earnings, the crush is going to happen. You're, if you have any gain in the call, it's going to be intrinsic only. There's not going to be any time premium left on that because you're two days away. Okay. The only way, Mark asked a question on what I just showed. He says, please show access to view the information on the option, which had various items, such as the implied volatility range, uh, and so forth and more. Okay. Anytime you're looking at an option, whether it's on the profit and loss chart, Mark, if you're in your portfolio, 
if I'm just on an option chain, which I'll open right now, let's say you're just looking at a standard option chain. Just click the more information button, go to research, and then option research or call or put research. Since I'm on the call and put chain, it shows me both, where I can link to the call or link to the put. If I'm looking at a specific option, the call in my portfolio, and I go to research, it's just going to show me the call research. And likewise, when we're just building that spread for CoConMark, here is where I can access it for the stock, uh, the stock research, but here where my options are listed in the trade details, once I've submitted it, you know, research, option research. In addition to the useful information of probability, implied volatility, the range, percent range, delta, gamma, theta, vega, Black-Scholes ratio, this isn't a great example because it's only three days of history, but we show the price, the history chart for certain information. The default is comparing the option bid price since the option was released on the market compared to the implied volatility, but you can also do it versus time value, open interest, bid, ask, stock price, black shoals, return if assigned, and more. My common one is usually option bid or option ask versus the IV. You can look at delta too. That's there. I forgot to mention that. And then, of course, if I change it, I would just draw a new chart. Let's go ahead and do that. So option bid versus delta. And yeah, steady rise. <laughs> steady rise up as it's going deeper in the money. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the, the portfolio. Let me show you something a little bit different. I'm going to use my October 55 put on GOOS. And we'll go to research and put research. So there again is all my information that we have. Down below is my chart. There was that giant 25-30% earnings pop on Goose back on 6 to 14, 6 16. Uh, but you see here the you know the option bid versus the delta. As the delta went higher, naturally the option bid's going lower. It's getting a deeper. <coughs> I'm sorry, yes, as reversing, of course, in that case. Uh, but let's go back to implied volatility. So I have it from April 20th to today. And it's pretty much a steady movement there. The option premium is lowering because the stock spiked up, volatility moved up, but it kind of stayed the same after that large jump in price. Okay. All right. Now, very quickly here, let's uh, run through some of this as well. Got a few more comments here. Um, let's say I was talking about his the Skechers trade and his SPY trade. He's selling. He's, he's got 281 calls. He's selling those and buying 275 for a month's time frame to manage it. Um, and we were talking about the long calls. I had mentioned that you know you have that percent to double. I'll take a look at this real quick. Uh, Sam had commented during that conversation that I missed uh, that he likes to buy 10% in the money. So in that case, you think, well, how much would I need if I paid five or six dollars for an option that's 10% in the money? What movement do I need on the stock in order to see my option bid price double? And it might be six or seven percent. Might be 10% because you're 10% in the money. So another 10% move would cause that to double. Okay, and following up on that, I wanted to take a look at this, Sam. You'd said HEIR have a huge move, bought it at 11, 17 today. Oh, bought it at 11 and 17, closed today at 26. Very nice. Uh, you sold 400 today. Uh, you don't have any options. Okay, okay, so that's a non-optionable trade that worked out well for you. And then you're trading some Apple bull puts and bear calls as well, and nothing in SQ or MU. Okay, good, good. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, oh, I didn't put it into this portfolio. I put it into my actual trading portfolio, but not on the webinar account. I believe it was Wednesday. You'd sent me the email about you were looking at UVXY, and I'd sent you, yeah, I did end up buying uh, five instead of 10, but I bought five 17 strike VIX options for August at a price of a dollar. Um, I think I'm sitting on a profit right now on those. Uh, Real quick, just let's take a look, because it's on my other portfolio there. Okay, let's go to the chain real quick. And it was the August, I want to say I did the 22nd. Yeah, I think I did the 22nd. Uh, now I'm not quite at a profit yet. It stayed at about 12.86. Um, yeah, so I think I'm pretty sure at the 17th, it's about the same where I purchased it. I think I got them at a dollar and the bid was 95 to 105, so I have no gain or no ask. It popped up a little bit today and then went back down to the norm uh, there also. All right. Okay. All 
All right. So Rajiv. Um, oh, sorry. We wanted to look at GE. He said it's skewed to the call and the put in that case. Um, and let's, yeah, let's go to August here. What I'm looking at is the implied volatilities. There's not a great skew in this case. They're, they're kind of close, aren't they? The stock's at 13.12, so naturally I'd expect the 13.50, 40 cents away to have a lower price than the 13. It's not skewed, it's just that it's between a strike. So if this went right between, if this was right at 13.25, I think both of these options would be closer to 18 cents. Now, they'd be both closer to 10 cents, the 13 and the 13.50. Um, for the July series, let's go to August, see if there's a skew there for GE. Yeah, see, it's because of the price. See, if the stock here is at 13.12, yes, it's a little bit in the money, but we're looking at the out of the money, this is only 12 cents out of the money, this is 88. If it moved up to 13.25, I'd expect both of these to go to a price of about 16 cents or so. This would lose 13 cents, so this would maybe, probably closer to 18 cents, 19 cents. So this would lose about 11 cents. This would gain about 9 cents. Not too much of a difference in skew here as far as that goes, what I'm seeing um, with equal values. Let's take a look here. Yeah, the volatilities are right about the same, 0.243 to 0.27. There's not too much of a skew. It's very small in that case. Um, but let's go, let's go almost two points out of the money here. We're at 15, two points out of the money to 11. They're both at the same price, two cents, three cents, three cents, four cents. I'm not seeing a lot of difference here, even going 28 days out between the skew of these positions. Naturally, as you go in the money, the volatility is going to increase for both that 0 0.62, 0 0.75, 0 0.85 range uh, as well. So I don't, it's skewed slightly, but I would not say this is skewed at all. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it was greatly skewed. I don't say it's a skew you kind of look for that I was talking about on Sears, where the time value on one of those options was much higher than the other one. Um, I mean, we're talking about the out-of-the-money call. One strike out of the money on Sears one month out had a premium of $0.10 cents extrinsic, whereas the put that was one strike out had $0.80 cents intrinsic. And that's when we were looking at two-and-a-half point strike differences, not one or not 50 cent strike differences as well, or dollar strike differences. So this looks about right to me. This doesn't look like too much of a skew because the, the 13s are closer to at the money, though one is 12 cents in the money, right? So you look at the 44.47 of the 13 strike call, there's 12 cents in the money. When you take out the 12 cents, that puts us at 32. It's right on par with the extrinsic value of the at the money 13 put. So uh, I'm not seeing uh, too much of that there, Rajiv. Okay, let's skip up to Mark here. Okay, so Mark says, I'm not sure if there's been much of a discussion on call butterflies or call condors or similar put equivalents. Any general comments? I noticed these can be used for non-balanced uh, valuations like above or below the money if anticipating a move. Yeah, um, and I think actually Rajiv just sent me one, as a matter of fact. Oh, you did a calendar. Uh, you did a calendar on that, and I'll get to your calendar in a moment. Kokan sent me a position, and Kokan, I do apologize. I forgot the symbol. I can't remember if it was for it was for Netflix. It was for Netflix ahead of earnings, and at the time, you know, Netflix was almost at about four hundred. And oh, sorry, folks. What Kokan had sent me on Monday was a plan that looked like it worked out fantastic. I don't have the exact numbers. But what he did for this expiration, when the stock was at about 400, if I'm not mistaken, I think he sold two 375 calls, had a 390, and bought a 365? Oh, 360. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that. It, it was some numbers like this. Now, I don't know the exact premium. He can send them to me if he wants, but that's not important. So what I'm going to show you here is this is an all-call butterfly on Netflix when it was around 400 with earnings coming out. And if I remember correctly, the net credit was somewhere above $2. Was that right? So maybe we sold these for about 
with intrinsic value at the time would have been twenty six, twenty seven dollars. Let's call it twenty seven. And the three ninety we would have paid about eleven for, and the three sixty would have been roughly maybe forty two or uh, forty three dollars or so, because of about forty points in the money and then some time premium. This might not look right, but I'll adjust it if it doesn't. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay, so what I did is made a completely bulletproof one. That's not what it was. <laughs> it wasn't a bulletproof butterfly. Uh, let's try 2650, shall we? That'll look a little bit better. Let's say okay, something along these lines, but better. Uh, this might even be close to what it was. So it actually was done at a debit of only a dollar. I think he actually got a credit on that position. But remember... When he entered this butterfly, it did have some risk. He was trying to do this in the money one to have a lower risk, but the stock was here. He was anticipating a bearish move, but it actually went below, but then came back up. So he's still sort of in the profit zone, and he probably was in the profit zone the first day. It fell 42 points, 43 points, something along those lines. But then, of course, it can be managed. We could lower this down to do an iron condor, perhaps, which would lower the profit, but now you've got an upper and lower break even. Move the call side, the bull call debit side down uh, in that case. But you've got the bear call still open. But you could do the same thing with puts. I could have done the same structure with puts, but it might have been done at a credit instead of a debit, and it still would have had the same profit and loss chart. Why don't I talk a lot about these? Why don't we discuss these? Well, it's because I have a hard enough time as it is trying to play an earnings. If I thought this was going to drop 25 points, saying I'm going to pinpoint this position, I'm more likely in that case, if I firmly believe it, to have bought just a 405 put. Rather than try to do a butterfly, have a 50-50 shot of it staying up that way and taking the minimal loss, don't get me wrong, with the hope for a large payout. I believe it was last week or the week before I talk about why I don't do these in my personal account. It's because I'm not good at pinpointing the price. And yes, this is a skew that you're expecting to be bearish, and it looked like it panned out for Cocon in this case. But again, if there's too large of a drop, you get a loss. If it stays the same or just moves down slightly, you get a loss. It is only a small loss, I agree. But what I've found personally is that when I'm picking the at the money, so let's say I did a 360 one right now thinking Netflix was not going to move, and it'd have a more loss on it if I did an at the money one. What I've typically found here is that when trading these consistently, you hardly ever get this. You never get, hardly ever, once in a blue moon, once out of maybe 40 trades, you get the max return. Sometimes you're more likely here or more likely here or more likely here, or more likely here. I'd say 50% of the time, I found myself being just at or just below the upper or lower break even. Okay, so sometimes I win, and sometimes I'm going to a little bit of a loss. And that's not balancing out too well. Sometimes I'm here, maybe 5 10% of the time. And sometimes I'm here, maybe 12 15% of the time. For me personally, I couldn't get it to last. Oh, sorry, folks. I couldn't get it to last long term. I couldn't profit on those long term. I have a hard enough time trying to pick where the stock is going to be trading regularly, let alone picking something that's 20, 30, 40 points down, expecting a large move downwards in time, okay? And they said, uh, sorry, Mark, you said corresponding comments on the call or call put or call condor to have an evenly spread gain. Well, yeah, but you're going to take out the max gain so that when you do suffer a loss, that still wipes out two other previous trades. Okay, now, right now on Netflix, if I did an all-call condor, which would be a bull call debit spread plus a bear call credit spread, not really looking at any probabilities, but just guessing wildly, I'm going to go 10 points above, 370, 375 for my bear call, 10 points below, 350, 345 for my bull call debit. Okay, so in the bull call debit, I'm selling a 350, buying a 345. My bear call, I'm selling a 370, buying a 375. Now you've got your plateau for the iron condor. I've got a good break-even range of about 30 points, 12 points up and about 14 points down. Okay, that looks pretty good, but it's here. And you know, Netflix could move 12 points or 14 points in the next 14 days. That is the strangest thing. 
Oh, right. No, it's not a strange thing at all. Um, <clears throat> this came out wrong because it's a debit condor. I apologize for that. Uh, we're paying 222 in this case, but we'd close one and get the five points back, and the other would expire worthless. So we're going to make 228 or so against 222. So it's a one to one risk reward ratio. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of the scenario that you're looking at, but you're taking on a larger risk than the butterfly because you're getting less premium as well. Yeah, that's, this is a call only condor. It's a bull call debit and a bear call credit. The put would be the same. You do get the wider upper to lower break evens, but your risk now goes closer to one to one where you saw with the peak and the butterfly, you don't get that. Okay. You get a better risk reward ratio. Now his Cocons was better skewed because he skewed it to one side. So the risk, if it did stay there, wasn't too much for the potential for the maximum return. Uh, Rajiv said he had a loss on Netflix too after the earnings, but uh, yeah, he did a 370, 375 after earnings, but it started to hit 380 from 340. So he got out for a small loss, and right now you'd probably be at full profit, uh, but still going that way. 370, 250, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. But yeah, the the I'm sorry, Mark, the, the put condors, all call condors, all put condors have the same risk reward profile of the iron condor, but you're just doing all of the other. It's usually done at a debit as we're seeing here, but it has the same risk reward as the iron condor. And as you start to set up that skew, you see you do end up more of a one-to-one -one ratio, which is okay. This isn't bad at all for the ratio that it is. If I paid a debit of 223, and I close the debit spread and get $5 back, well, the bear call expires worthless. We make a max profit of, uh, what did I say, 228 or so. I did that right. Let's see. I sold the 375 call. No, bought the 375, sold 370. That's right. Sold the 350, bought the 345. That's right. There it is. That's There it is. I don't know why it didn't come up right the first time. I apologize. Debit of 222, but you get the five points back if you're right if the debit spread closes in the money. So max profit of 27.8%. Now, why is it showing you that you're only making 38.5%? It's because the debit to pay is over here. Your broker is still going to charge you the margin most likely on this bear call credit spread side. So you actually have to probably put up 722 or so to enter this trade to get 278 back. Okay, that's not a bad thing, um, but it's not really one-to-one -one as I was describing because I would have to, I forgot about that, I would have to cover the margin. The extra long call doesn't cover it because it has to cover this short call right here. All right. Yeah, Sam said he was looking to buy Wednesday, Wednesday to today. You're buying puts on Netflix to uh, go with the hedge, I guess. Yeah, I didn't touch Netflix. Sam also didn't do a straddle on Netflix because the volatility didn't work out mathematically. I experienced the same thing. Um, uh, Greg in the office was actually in a married put going into earnings on that position that uh, I'd mentioned he might want to lock in some gains on, but he left it alone. Still very profitable position from when he got in. Um, but again, it's I was trying to do a straddle when he reminded me that the earnings were coming up on Netflix. I didn't like the prices. It looked like it needed too big of a swing to be profitable course, sure enough, the big enough swing happened, but ironically with the strikes I was doing, I was actually going to do a strangle because I don't want to pay too much into it, but the strikes I would have used for the strangle would have been a 20% profit, which isn't bad, but because of the prices, I would have only had two or three contracts, so it wasn't that great of a trade, so I did some other things. Nothing special, though. I didn't get into Skechers. <laughs> I didn't do a straddle on Skechers, which I'm regretting. Okay. Rajiv. Calendar call, calendar spread time. IBM Calendar sold the 150 August 3rd. Let me clear up my windows here for a little bit. We're going to August 3rd, sold the IBM call. So let's go to IBM on our custom spread tool once more. Nice little diagonal here. August 3rd, 150. Sorry, didn't mean to whistle in the microphone there. And for the 10th of August, very close, 149. Okay, so we sold a 150, bought a 149. It's an out-of-the-money diagonal one week apart. Your debit was 33 cents. So I'm at 48. I've got to jump this up 15. 
sell that for 65 by the 149 for a dollar. Of course, though, the stock's below it. You're kind of in the loss area now. Um, now, you're still bullish on this. Can I cover the short strike and keep the long open? Am I still on profit? For right now, what I'm seeing, you're a little bit below profit level. Your break even is 147.44, and that's at August 3rd expiration. I don't know. You're, you're bullish on it, so I, I'm not even going to suggest it. Of course, someone, some might suggest that what we could do is just roll down this call to the August 3rd 149 for a little bit more premium. Now, you'd have a horizontal instead of a diagonal, um, which I don't think you want. So I could buy to close this, but it's up at 49 cents. And sell to close, sell to open the 149 at 71. Okay, so buy that, sell that. Are you really getting any advantage out of this? You're getting about 20 cents, and puts you right at about the break even. But now you've got that peak there at 149. You could do that. When are the earnings? Or did the earnings? Did I miss it? Did the earnings? Oh, the earnings already came out, right? It moved about four percent. Was that it, right? Yeah, it came out uh, 716. I think it moved about 4.2, 4.4%. 4 I remember seeing that. Okay, so you're still bullish, but this is an idea. You could just roll it down to this lower strike here to keep it a, you've now created a horizontal where you could still make a profit of 81. Your total cost in is only 13. You're getting an extra 20 cents out of the position, and right now you're about to break even on the position. Okay. Why not roll the short call down further? Well, because then you're actually creating a bearish position, which I didn't want to suggest. You said you're still bullish. If I tried to get more premium, and instead of having my 149 long and converting my short call down to a 149 shirt one week apart, so I'd have the August 3rd 149, the August 10th 149 with a 13 cent uh, price it looked like, why not get more premium and go down to the 148 or the 147? Well, that's because you get a lot more premium. Let's do the 148, not the 147. 148 for August 3rd is at a dollar, a little bit above a dollar. So I buy to close the 150 at 51 cents for about a wash, maybe a slight gain. Um, based on my numbers, I don't know what your numbers were. You said they had a debit of 33 cents there. So this might still look good, but look, now where's your loss? It's to the upside if the stock moves above 150. So that might be a trap you don't want to get stuck in by rolling down too far. But we did see that we could get a decent position by just rolling down to the same strike, making a horizontal at 149, 149, and then you still have the opportunity, Rajiv, to manage it going forward. Or just leave it as is, depending on your outlook. You know, even though you're a little bit below break even right now, you're in a loss area right now by what I'm showing, you know, you could make $119 on this trade if it does, oh, sorry folks, if it does recover and goes back up to 150, the 33, 35 cent debit, getting up to that point there, you'd have a profit of maybe 119, 340%. If you roll down, remember, you, we kept about the same cost basis, we lowered it a little bit, but the max profit was now 81. It was showing a much lower percentage, but it's still a good percentage, and right now you'd be at a profit. And it's going to lower that break even down for you by rolling down to the 149 for August 3rd. Um, of course, you could do other ones also. Oh, sure. I mean, yes, of course. You say, can I cover the short and keep the long open? Sure. Of course you can. You'll just have a long call now. Um, you know, I don't know. You said you gave me a premium, a debit for the position of 33 cents. I had to fake a cost basis for your August 3rd series uh, of what it would be at the 150, but it's currently at about 51 cents midpoint. So you might take a loss on that, and then you'd be just left with a long call, August 10th, 149 strike, which the cost basis would adjust if you paid a debit to close the position. Instead of having this at one, if it cost me 75 cents to buy it back, my new long call cost would be 110. Sure, you can do that if you're that bullish on the position. Absolutely. But again, you could also hedge it by rolling down a little bit. Sam brings up an interesting point. Anyone feel free to comment. Uh, Sam says that uh, he's got uh, COP, which has uh, had some movement to it, uh, the oil stock, ConocoPhillips. He says he has COP at 65, and he says he doesn't see any comments. Uh, no one is buying oil stocks. I don't see any oil stocks comment. I had a couple questions last week 
uh, I thought it was last week in the recording, I think it was a COP position, ConocoPhillips position, had a couple of discussions uh, about Exxon this week in coaching sessions with some clients, uh, some Power Options subscribers. What it seems to me, Sam, is that you're right. I don't have the logic for it, uh, logic, <laughs> I don't know the reason behind it. Um, some people maybe are taking flyers here and there, but it seems most people I'm talking to, a handful of people who are in oil stocks, they're not opening new positions, they're managing positions they got into after the March 21st to April 5th sort of movement with the trade tariffs and everything along those lines. People tried to do different plays or they were selling puts at that time um, uh, on the position. Um, based on the tariff news and the market pulling down, selling puts, maybe even buying some calls and so forth. Um, but they got the stock put to them. So now they're managing those positions, but they're not opening new positions in oil. Mark did, uh, I think we even talked about this maybe two weeks ago or last week. Mark did have a credit spread. He had a bear call credit spread on XLE for a gain in the last month. Um, just haven't done there. And then Sam, you lost on CVX. I do have a customer, a radioactive trading, a fusion subscriber who's in CVX. Uh, he had the married put move against him, and we discussed uh, two weeks ago management techniques um, that he could use, the income methods that he could use. Okay, <clears throat> it's an interesting comment by Rajiv. Can't support or deny this. He says that oil will not my sentiments. This is Rajiv's. He says oil go down. The Ramco IPO will come out soon. People started cutting positions now. Okay, so the Ramco IPO for that as well. Um, XLE is a good one. We did have a conversation. If anyone remembers, I can't remember if it was a butterfly discussion or a, it might have been Mark's credit spread discussion. We were talking about lower volatility condors or butterflies on XLE, SPY, and uh, something else. I think that was two weeks ago when we entered into that conversation, the butterflies a little bit on the lower volatility, lower volatility ETFs and more. But you're right, Sam. It doesn't seem like that's the case. And I think a lot of people are still trying to play the FANG stocks for quick bucks here and there going forward. Um, looking still at Netflix now that it's got its volatility back a little bit and it's been bouncing around um, as well as other positions. Google was funny. You know, everyone thought it was uh, going to have a huge hit because of the, uh, the fine. It didn't seem to be that big. And it was just like the question we had last week on Johnson & Johnson where the, uh, I mean, Johnson & Johnson I think has continued to move down when I checked it on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, let's take a look. Yeah, it's at 125.85. We were talking about the, um, what do we call it, the uh, class action suit. Thank you, Raji. <laughs> it's the class action suit I think you were asking about. And the day it came out, it wasn't that big of a hit, and the day after it wasn't, but it has given some back, and it has started to pull down there and move back down. And GLD, of course, different sector. Mark says uh, he's been playing bear call credit spreads in the last month on GLD. Very nice, very nice. So I've been looking at SLV, too. Um, Sam feels Fang is going to fall hard one of these days. I know. I just don't know if it's going to be balance out where it's going to be so quick or one's going to keep it up a little bit and then it's going to drop back down. And uh, Dustin Nugget, uh, buying those is also, Rajiv mentioned he's opened a new position in Delta. Uh, yeah. And, of course, diversification is always good, but you've got to pay attention that you don't give up the gains in one sector uh, to another sector, trying to diversify too much. Uh, not really the comment Sam made, but that's usually where I tell investors. Diversification is great, but if you say, hey, I really want to do well in oil, but I'm going to offset it with gold. Well, if one goes up and the other goes down, you haven't diversified a little bit more than that, then you're just trading off one direction or the other. Um, depending on the market scenario, they could both go up, they could both go down. That's true. So. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see any further questions. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me, of course. I want to Kokan had mentioned that uh, he really liked the analysis on the volatility and the discussion on the TRN position. Excellent. I'm glad that met your needs for our discussion today um, in regards to that. And, of course, I just uh, want to remind everyone uh, that today's material are my thoughts on your questions, your comments designed for educational purposes, increase investing performance, and options knowledge. Any of the stocks or options discussed today should not be taken as direct trading suggestions or recommendations. Options, of course, do involve risk, may not be suitable for all investors. And once again, I copied over from an old one and forgot to take that out. We don't have a market holiday again until Memorial Day. Uh, but what I will tell you here, this, we will be back again what is today, the 20th? I apologize. 
we will be back again next week, of course, on the 27th. However, we will not have a Friday discussion the following week on August 3rd. But we will be here next week, and we will be back August 10th. We will not be here August 3rd. So I will likely see everyone next week for our next open discussion session. And then we'll take a week off, and we'll be right back at it. For those of you who have not taken a trial yet, remember you can test power options, the tools we looked at today, that powerful stock repair tool for trying to fix a broken position, the insurance tool for finding puts against your stock to lock in gains or help uh, prevent further loss, analysis with the custom spread tool and the portfolio tools we saw today, plus creating your own search in over 23 different strategies. Just put in your name and email, no billing required, no credit card required, get your 14-day free trial and you'll be able to test out all of our tools with no risk of being billed or anything like that. After your trial, the subscription start at $40 per month for end of day data. We do offer a 20 minute delayed service, which is only 60, and then of course, real time service and full access to historical data. We showed a couple days back with the uh, chain today, our historical data that you can search in a strategy against, see which position would have matched your criteria goes back to April of 2006, so about 12, over 12 years of options data. Now, if you want to check out other of our educational materials, remember you can go to the blog at any time, blog.powerop.com. We showed you how you could access the webinars page, powerop.com slash webinars.asp. That is a public page. You don't need a trial or subscription to access it. Uh, we talked about that webinar on the price watch alerts and the morning updates and how to create your own search and have that emailed to you. You want to check that out there. Um, of course, there's tons of webinars on managing spreads, managing positions, um, getting into certain strategies. There's also a variety of webinars on options concepts as far as uh, the Greeks and why you may not need them for certain strategies, analyzing implied volatility and more. Of course, you can always check us out on YouTube. Remember, if you think of another question later on this weekend or next week, just send me an email anytime to support at powerop.com or support at radioactivetrading.com. Remember, you can also call us during market hours at 302-992-7971. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, the discussions I had uh, here the last past couple of days, if you're a member of Power Options, a trial member, a subscriber, or a member of the Fusion Service at Radioactive Trading, you'll schedule a coaching session at any time. Last comment here, Sam says, thank you so much. Um, have a nice weekend and come back strong. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what the market's going to do next week. I've got a couple positions I really want to enhance the performance on if they go the right direction or plan for a different way. And I'm going to make my plan by Wednesday of next week. Goose is one of them. The Mary put I'm in there. Ollie is the other one. Sony, I've really got to figure out. Um, don't have to really figure it out, but I want to do something really good on that position to get it back to where I want it to be. And it's really close to where I want it to be, but I don't want to miss it. I also don't want to overtrade it. So we'll see what happens next week. Ladies and gentlemen, take care of yourselves as well. Have a fantastic weekend. We will see you next week and you'll see other information and uh, other emails as well. One last comment. Uh, Mark says he is high in cash in the moment, bearish on SPY for right now. To tell you the truth, I think Ernie might be in the same boat. Uh, I think he pulled some of his positions out and he's sitting on more cash than he normally does while hedging his positions uh, using straddles for earnings still, but also hedging some of his covered calls with collars and his married put positions as well. But he has pulled some out in cash just in case something gets triggered next. We'll see. But we'll still be here if it does happen or doesn't happen. So I'll see you all next week. Take care. Good night.